<laughs> this is attempt number two. Um, Facebook, for whatever reason, just booted me out and uh, I had to start the video again. So here we are for First Chapter Fun. This is episode number eight, I believe. Eight of almost 40. Good morning, Natalie. Natalie, you're such an avid watcher of this episode. And we have Jennifer as well on Instagram Live. That's absolutely wonderful. I'm going to wave at Jennifer. There we go. How are you doing this morning? Is everybody okay? I hope everyone's okay in these crazy times. I had a horrible headache yesterday that lasted all day and I had a migraine in the end and I decided to go to bed really early. Um, I think by about nine o'clock I was asleep so I feel a lot better today. Um, Natalie says I love the books and the break from my boys. <laughs> Mine are out there and I've told them at 11.30 I'm going live so be, be quiet and uh, and they've been they've been behaving very well. So um, Jennifer says all is good. This series helps so much. Feel better. Oh, thank you. Oh, and hello, Lex. One of my boys has just joined, so he's watching too. So that's quite funny. So let's get started, shall we, with today's book? So today we have a book called *The Favorite Daughter* by Kara Ruder. This came out um, was it last year? I can't remember now, but it's an excellent psychological thriller. So Kara writes um, these wonderful characters that you that you love to hate. And before The Favourite Daughter came out, her previous book, look at that cover, isn't that gorgeous? That is called Best Day Ever. And this book, as with The Favourite Daughter, you have protagonists that you actually love to hate because they are... Uh, they're so diabolical. They're actually very funny. Um, very, very dark sense of humour, which is right up my street. And in both of these, you have characters that are just so, so evil, really. Um, narcissistic um, and na narcissistic sociopaths, I think, is really the only way to describe them. And I, <laughs> and I love them. So today I'm reading from Kara's book, The Favourite Daughter. And I thought I'd mix things up a little bit and I would read you uh, the synopsis or the book blurb, if you like. Hey, Kaylee, good morning. So I thought I'd read you that um, because that way you get more of a sense of the book. And then I'll read you part of the first chapter. How does how does that sound? Hello, Kendra. Hello, Dice Girl 84. <laughs> That's really funny. Um, so let me let me read the synopsis to you. So for those who've just joined, this is Kara Ruder's The Favourite Daughter, which is which is awesome. All right. So this is the synopsis. The perfect home, the perfect family, the perfect lie. Jane Harris lives in a sparkling home in an oceanfront gated community in Southern California. It's a place that seems too beautiful to be touched by sadness. But exactly one year ago, Jane's eldest daughter, Mary, died in a tragic accident, and Jane has been grief-stricken ever since. Lost in a haze of antidepressants, she's barely even left the house. Until now. As Jane re-emerges into the world, it's clear she's missed a lot in the last year. Her husband has been working long days and nights at the office. Her daughter, Betsy, seems distant, even secretive. And then Jane receives a note warning her that Mary's death wasn't an accident. What really happened on the day Mary died? And who is lying to whom in this family? The bonds between mothers and daughters, husbands and wives should never be broken. But you never know how far someone will go to keep a family together. So, that was the blurb of The Favourite Daughter. And I shall now read you part of chapter one. So this is The Favourite Daughter by Kara Ruder, chapter one. 6.30 p.m. I glance at my creation and smile. Behold the dining room table. It's critical to create the proper atmosphere when entertaining, the illusion of perfection. As one of the most important hostesses in the cove, I can assure you I pull together elegant dinners without a second thought. I know all the key ingredients. Arrangements from the best florist in town. Tonight, white hydrangeas nestled in between succulents. 
and linens from the exclusive small boutique where everyone must shop to purchase ridiculously expensive tablecloths and napkins, in this case, brushed silk off-white. I've outdone myself with this table. This will go down in the record books as the crowning achievement in my life. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. I don't care a smidgen about entertaining. And typically, if I'm going to spend time adorning something, it's going to be myself. Truth be told, the crystal and china pieces on the table were wedding gifts from long forgotten friends, rarely used. I dug them out from the back of the cupboard. Perhaps I'm trying a bit too hard, but tonight is special. It's my coming out party, so to speak. After a year of grieving, it's time to step back into my family, or what remains of it. And that's precisely my plan. I'm reclaiming the throne, like a queen who has been in exile but returns with pomp and circumstance. I shake my head as I look around my castle. I used to be so proud of this home, something so expensive and so uppity that my mother would never be comfortable stepping foot inside. Good old mum. She taught me everything she knew about how to put yourself first in life. She was ruthless, delighting in bringing others down, including her own daughter. But look around. I'm winning, Mum. I touch the diamond-encrusted heart pendant hanging between my surgically enhanced, perfect breasts. All gifts from my husband in happier times. My husband, David, will be so surprised when he arrives home tonight, and he deserves it. He's been full of surprises this year, in fact. I discovered another little secret when a piece of mail arrived at our house last week. Typically, he has his mail sent to his office, says it's easier to pay the bills that way. This particular notice from the bank must have just slipped through the cracks. I'm playing along, for now. The letter congratulated David on the purchase of a new home. I must admit, the thought of a fresh start made my heart flutter. I know it will be even bigger, more expensive than this home. I mean, this home was fine when the kids were growing up, but now we need something grander, more fitting of our station in life. We deserve it after all we've been through. Maybe he'll tell me all about it tonight. That would be wonderful. I'm planning our reconnection dinner and he'll announce his surprise. I glance at my platinum watch, enjoying the sparkles of the diamond encrusted face until my heart thumps at the time. It's getting late and I have so much more to do. I can't believe I've lost a year in my haze of grief. Sure, some of the haze can be blamed on all of the antidepressants the doctors made me take. They were both a relief and a distraction. While I was stuck in bed at home, my family members have made the most of their time, both so busy in fact, I've had trouble keeping up. But not any longer, I'm back drug-free and better than ever. I grab the final crystal wine glass from the kitchen counter and walk to the table, glancing out the window as the bright orange sun drops into the deep blue Pacific Ocean. In an instant, the glass topples from my hand and seems to tumble in slow motion as it falls and shatters on the stone floor, sending sound waves echoing through our lifeless house like an earthquake. Shards of glass sprinkle the tops of my bare feet and dot the floor around me while a large chunk of the stem rests under the dining room table, glistening like the blade of a knife. I fold my arms across my chest for comfort and can't help but admire my ribs poking into my hands, a reminder of how much weight I've lost the last year. Grief is good for the figure. You and I already know thin women get attention, respect in our society. On the few excursions I've made out of the house lately, when I've taken care to dress and apply makeup, I've noticed an uptick in appreciative glances from men. That's nothing new. My whole life I've enjoyed the admiration of the opposite sex. For months I've been secretly working out in the garage when, when David is at work and Betsy at school. Just me and the handsome P90X instructors. My mum would be impressed by my fitness commitment. She never missed a chance to remind me being skinny was the key to our future. And then she'd take my dinner away. She's long gone, died when I was 14 in a tragic car accident, but she still haunts me. 
That's the power of the bond between mothers and daughters. It can never be broken, even in death. But glass can. I stare at my almost perfect table setting. I even nestled votive candles in crystal holders around the centrepiece and in front of each place setting. Just call me Martha Stewart. I wonder what I should wear tonight. Here, in the land of expensive designer purses and shoes, most women blend in. Their monochromatic coolness anchored by jeans, topped by their perfectly smooth porcelain faces. I remember my first dinner at the Cove, me from the South, them from Southern California. I'd worn a yellow silk cocktail dress, my biggest pearls, and wrapped a white cashmere pashmina around my shoulders. I was as out of place as a Twinkie at a Weight Watchers meeting. But you know what? All the husbands approved, tired of the sameness they endured in their wives. Back then, David was proud to have me on his arm. Proud, I stood out like a beautiful flower in a meadow of boring grass. It's ironic, really. I gave up my dreams to move here, to become the perfect Orange County housewife. I could have been so much more. This ocean view is why we bought this home all those years ago, scraping together every last dime and tapping into David's trust fund to move into the Cove, the best community in Southern California. We were young parents and so madly in love. The ocean was romantic, beautiful then, not deadly and dark and cold. I feel the rush of heat as my hands clench into fists. Anger and loss, did you ever notice how those emotions mix together? It's a toxic combination. I swallow. I need to focus on the table, the first step of my coming out party. All that's missing from this perfect setting is the fourth wine glass. I have another, of course. It's almost symbolic. It was Mary's spot at the table, Mary's wine glass that fell to the floor. Mary, who dropped into the sea. I shake my head to quiet the voice. That was part of the first chapter of The Favourite Daughter. And let me tell you, this is not one to miss if you enjoy protagonists who are basically sociopaths, narcissistic sociopaths, then do yourself a favour and check out The Favourite Daughter, but also Best Day Ever. The protagonist Paul in this is, is hilarious and shocking at the same time and disturbing. You can't go wrong with these two guys. So that was an extract of The Favourite Daughter and tomorrow's book. Tomorrow, I'm very excited about this one. This is a new one. So The Favourite Daughter and The Best Day Ever are both out now. Um, we have we have Natalie saying, I'm going bro broke ordering all these books. <laughs> That's so funny. Oh, hi, Audio Shelf is here. Fantastic. That's so cool. So let me see if I can angle this properly. This is what I'll be reading from tomorrow. There's a bit of glare going on here. There we go, that's better. Tomorrow I'll be reading The Swap, part of The Swap by Robin Harding. Um, and if you can see those rings in a bowl, that's exactly what the book is about. Rings in a bowl, boys and girls. So we'll find out more about that one tomorrow. So I hope I've enticed you to, to read fabulously sinister characters as Amy says yes they really are um, check these these ones out if you get a chance to and I'll post the video as always on Instagram and on Facebook don't forget to leave some questions and comments for Kara she'll be more than delighted to answer them and uh, until then until next time stay safe stay kind and I'll see you tomorrow guys bye for now